Hey, this is Pia from Metal and High Heels. I'm standing here with Mark, the producer of Soaring Highs and Brutal Lows, the movie, the documentary we just watched. And um, how are you happy with today's screening? I'm very happy. It's a full house, a great performance afterwards. It's a nice theater, a nice beer on tap. So couldn't be happier. Cool. Um, and how have the reactions been so far? So far, they've been very good. Not a lot of people have seen the film. I sent it out to some film festivals, some distributors, and uh, the people who are in the film. And, you know, either they like it or they're too polite to say otherwise. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go with that. How many hours have you spent with filming, editing, and so on? Oh God, uh, all of them. Um, yeah. I started like uh, April of 2013, sending out inquiries, started filming in September 2013 and it's just been on and off since then trying to either shoot more material, pull stuff together, do really boring stuff like music licensing, so it's been a while. Yeah. And you met the musicians several times, for example Flora Jansen, you met her very often. I met with Floor. I only met, well, I did about eight hours of interviews with Floor, and I did between an hour and th four hours with the others, mm -hmm. depending on who was available and um, and travel plans. Basically, a lot of them don't make it to the to the states, so you know I can only be in Europe so often for so long. So I, I tried to schedule it around festivals and tours, and when everyone was in, you know within a 200 mile radius at any given time, so, mm -hmm. yeah. And it looked like um, you met them in very intimate rooms in their homes or something, or where did you meet them? Um, sometimes it was their home, some it was the tour bus, some mm -hmm. it was backstages, um, yeah, wherever I could, really. <laughs> How many people have been involved in the documentary um, on editing and so on, or did you do it everything on your own? Um, I did the majority of the editing. I brought in another guy who just finished um, his project immediately before was a, a documentary on the U.S. Olympic swim team, the women's swim team. Mm -hmm. and so he was really, really helpful in that. Um, but in terms of editing, yeah, that was that was about it. Um, I had a buddy who's a screenwriter. Um, he's a writer for Iron Sky 2, if you've seen any of those. And um, he gave me some sort of creative uh, tips here and there. Uh, I got another friend who's a uh, who's one of the editors on Big Mama's House and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So different people gave input, but as far as the actual day-to-day -day work, it was me and mostly me, and then another guy who came in and you know took what I had assembled, and made it look look good. Mm -hmm. um, are there any musicians you wanted to interview but you couldn't for some reason? Uh, I would have liked to have gotten uh, Christina from Lacuna Coil mm -hmm. uh, just because she has a lot to say and seems like a really interesting. I would have loved to have gotten Taria uh, just because it's sort of, you know, in the symphonic metal, it's hard to not mention her. Mm -hmm. um, and so the obvious, you know, when you look online, there's always people, well, what about this person? And that's one of the, those are probably the two biggest names. It's like, eh, it would have been really more complete. Mm -hmm. But I think the story still, still really stands even without them. Yeah. Um, you uh, had a very intimate moment with Flo Janssen when she actually started crying, uh, something. Yes. How did you feel in that situation? I should probably not answer that question, but I felt horribly, horribly conflicted. Mm. Um, because like, I quite like you know, Flo as a person and as a performer. Um, but you know, when you've got like the filmmaker hat on, you're like, yes, this is great. But at the same time, you're like, but she's really, really sad, and it's your fault. So, yeah. What can you do? Difficult situation, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and are there any funny things that happened during the recording besides the outtakes we just saw? <laughs> there, yeah. There's a ton of of stuff that's not in there. I tried, if you. If you watch the outtakes during the credits carefully, they all more or less relate to the credits that are on screen, mm -hmm. um, which probably maybe two people in the world will notice, um, maybe more now that I've said something. But 
yeah, I mean, there's there's a ton of just weird stuff that happened. Um, someone was asking me before, there's one thing in the credits about uh, the kid who gave me a ride to the, the train station on the second or third shoot, I forget which. I had gotten off the airplane off an 11 hour flight. I drove somewhere, it took me an hour and a half. I was going to a meeting. Anyway, the guy wasn't there and then I drove another two hours somewhere else and I almost made it. And I completely totaled my, my rental car into the side of a semi um, and was just wrecked by the side of the road. And I ended up in like, I literally was like five minutes away from the town I was trying to get to. And some random kid at the garage like gave me a lift to the train station. Like he was just hanging out. He had nothing better to do. And he's like, oh, I'll take you. Don't know what his name is. Never seen him. You know. <laughs> cool. But anyway, yeah. Kind of funny. I almost died, but you know, it's still funny. <laughs> um, that would have been my next question. Um, how many extra material have you got? And how huge is the outtake section on the DVD? Um, the outtakes, like the funny outtakes are, you know, like this much, but mm -hmm. there's a ton of material that I just, I couldn't squeeze in somehow. Um, the, the idea behind the film was to make a coherent story. And so, you know, the, the stories tend to blend into one another and lead sort of organically into the next part. So there's a lot of great stories, like Doro had some great stories, and Mark Anson had some, and there just, there wasn't a spot for them. So, you know. Fortunately, there doesn't need to be any sort of narrative thread through bonus material, so I'm just going to try to, you know, load all that in there, or just you know, toss it out on the web for free so people can enjoy it. Mm. Um, I think it was Charlotte No Oflor who mentioned, um, if you were a woman, you wouldn't have asked that particular yes. quest question. Um, do you think the documentary would have been much different if you were a woman? Um, it'd probably look a lot better. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I had talked to Charlotte about this a couple months ago, uh, earlier this summer, and it was more of a, an academic sort of discussion over the role of the documentarian in, you know, in observing and choosing what you see and what you don't. And what I tried to do in this, I mean, apart from one or two, you know, brief bits, you don't see me at all, you don't hear me at all. Mm -hmm. And it's really just uh, the ladies, the, the performers who are doing all the talking. Um, yes, I chose the bits that go in there, but for the most part, you know, I tried to stay out of it as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, one would hope that it would it would be fairly similar if a woman did it. But you know, I'm not one. I can't tell you. Yeah, the movie, um, the documentary actually looks like a conversation or something between the woman, so that was really cool. Thank God you said that, because that was what we were going through. <laughs> I don't know if it worked or not. Mm. It looked quite natural, what they were talking, uh, yeah. I will, I will tell my wife. <laughs> will be very happy. Um, what do you personally like better, the soaring highs or the brutal lows? Oh, um, it really depends. I mean, I like the energy out of it, mm -hmm. and sometimes that's the highs, sometimes it's the lows. Um, you know, for me, it doesn't really matter the gender of the singer or any of that. You know, either you can you can nail that feel through the music, and you know, it touches you in here, or or it doesn't. Um, like we just had the acoustic performance with uh, Marcella and Stream of Passion, that was really awesome. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I'll go home and listen to a band like Amana Marth, and you know, which is nothing like that. So, um, I think every one of the women said um, it is kind of weird to say it is female-fronted metal just because of the gender. But um, you decided to do this movie about the female-fronted scene. So, um, what is, in your opinion, special about the female-fronted metal scene? Um. It's a, it's a tough question, really. Um, it's a slightly leading question as well. I've talked to a, a bunch of people, and some people want to say, well, you know, what's, you know, why is this the best thing ever? Or, personally, I just, when I watched other documentaries, it seemed like reading an encyclopedia. You know, like in the beginning, there was Black Sabbath, and then there was Priest, and then there was Maiden, and then there was, 
And it was like reading a history book. And it's like, that isn't very interesting to me. What's interesting is these people. And like, what it comes down to is there's these women who are classically trained who could really do anything, right? And they're choosing to do this. And it's not like there's a ton of money in metal. Um, you know, in some cases, really nobody cares outside of the home country. In some cases, they don't even care in the home country. It seems like a really stupid thing to do in law. Like, why would you do that? If you have that much talent and, you know, most of these women are very attractive, it's like, you could really do anything and you've chosen to do this. And it was that sort of juxtaposition of these two positions that I thought was really interesting. Mm. Um, you know, it happens that they're all metal singers and I like that. So I guess that, that's a sort of long way around of an answer. Um, you interviewed a lot of women from Europe, and there were, I think, Alyssa and Cobra from Canada. Yes. Um, but what is, um, Alyssa plays in Arch Enemy now, so it's to a European band. Yes. What's um, the female-fronted scene in, in the US or in North America like? Uh, Maybe also compared to the European scene. It doesn't seem like it's caught on. Um, and in fact, I had a, an entire section of the film devoted to that. Um, which will be in the, the bonus materials. Um, it got a little, a little dry and a little geopolitical as, in terms of you know, possible answers to that question. Mm -hmm. um, but I suppose the basic answer is there's not really a huge female-fronted scene in the US, uh, certainly not in the symphonic metal way that there is here. Um, so yeah, that was, that was a, a large part of it. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, thank you for the interview. Um, is there something you want to add? I hope everyone enjoys the movie and I hope I didn't screw it up too bad. <laughs> thank you so much.